Hi, lovely people. Oh my gosh. I keep trying to start recording this and um, then my cat interrupts me. And he's normally so good when I record, like he normally just sits really quietly. So I don't know what his problem is today. <laughs> I tried bribing him with catnip, but this time it didn't work. Anyway, uh, I have a really fun movie for you guys today. It is Modesty Blaze, which is a 1966 film starring Monica Vitti, Terence Stamp, Dirk Bogard, and it was directed by Joseph Losey. It's a spy comedy film, like a spoof of spy films. It has a bit of a kind of comedic James Bond element to it sometimes, and other movies sort of in that genre. I would say it's more, to me, it's more of a 60s fashion caper, but it's based on the comic strip by Peter O'Donnell and the, the characters within his stories and it was uh, adapted into a screenplay by Evan Jones and Harold Pinter. Um, yeah, it's not really a faithful adaptation. If you were a Modesty Blaze fan, like coming to it, I think you'd probably not like it. I'm not sure, but yeah, <laughs> let's get into it a little bit. So Modesty Blaze is a former criminal. She's like a mastermind criminal and she's working with the British Secret Service and gets tasked with protecting a shipment, shipment of diamonds on their way to an Arab sheikh. And yeah, he happens to love Modesty Blaze as if she were his son, which I don't know, it just made me laugh. I don't know why. It's not really that funny, but I just kind of liked the way that scene played out. Uh, the diamonds have attracted the attention of Gabriel, who is the bad guy of the movie. He has his little gang with um, his accountant, McWhirter, his bodyguard, Mrs. Fothergill, and Modesty thought Gabriel was dead, so he's sort of a surprise villain for her. He has a bundle of weird and wonderful henchmen, which is really fun. It does remind me of the sidekicks that Bond villains have that always have those weird like talents and stuff, just do weird things. But uh, yeah, Modesty has her own sidekick and her partner in crime, which is Willie Garvin. And yeah, there's plenty of intrigue, fights, costume changes. There's a couple of musical numbers and a daring kind of escape from an island. So. Yeah, I mean, I watched this film. I'm not 100% sure what happens in a way. It's very convoluted. And yeah, I mean, if you're focusing on plot in this film, you're sort of missing the point. It's much more like a stylized, fun, 60s, fourth wall breaking kind of a romp, which is really fun. So uh, yeah. So as I sort of mentioned, I think, uh, this stars Monica Vitti in the role of Modesty. She actually died this month, which is um, quite sad. She was an Italian actress, and she has this beautiful accent in this movie. And she worked with Antonioni. Antonioni. That's a really nice name to say. Um, she was known as the queen of Italian cinema. And this is her first English language film. She was in more serious stuff with Antonioni and moved more into comedies in the later sort of 60s and uh, on from there. So Willie Garvin is played by Terence Stamp and <laughs> his Wikipedia page describes him as the master of brooding silence. <laughs> I mean, Wikipedia, anyone can edit it. He could have put that in himself and that kind of tickles me a little bit, but uh, I just think that's funny. I don't know why. But yeah, he was a big part of the London swinging 60s scene. He dated Jean Shrimpton and Julie Christie. Um, but yeah, so he was kind of part of that set. He did have some fashion shoots. I think he was in a David Bailey shoot or two or something. But anyway, you might know him more as General Zod in the old Superman movies. He was in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And most recently, I think... Uh, he was in Last Night in Soho, which is another stylish kind of a uh, film as well. He has a really great look in this film. Um, he's very, he really plays up the Cockney accent because that's his character. Willie Garvin has that background and he's kind of interesting because she is so 
playful and stylish as a character and his character is really not very nice and I find Terrence Stamp sometimes plays these types or that kind of comes across I'm not sure but he's kind of like really mean to this girl who's in the movie with him uh, it's a character in the movie and she has feelings she has feelings as people do and he's like isn't that just like a woman and it's like you know yeah that is just like a woman to have human emotions like <laughs> you know he's kind of like that kind of a person um not him himself i've never met him i mean his character so that was kind of interesting to me i didn't really see how you know her kind of playfulness and her confidence fit with somebody who was kind of so not nice but it kind of works as well uh yeah, and then Gabriel is played by Dirk Bogard, who I really like as an actor. He's kind of, I don't know, he's, he worked, he has a lovely face, basically, and it's very expressive, and I think here he gets to be funny and kind of funny and handsome and stylish a little bit, but also a little bit off-center, off center off off, some, something's off about him, you know what I mean? Because obviously here he's a bad guy. So I think he does that really well. Uh, he was an actor and a writer and he starred in, there's a series of films, um, like they just call them the Doctor series. And uh, they're about, I don't know, I suppose that's another, another story for another time, but they were a film series in the fifties and sixties. And he was kind of a matinee idol as they used to call them in that. I talked about the film The Servant, which he is he stars in. He's so good in that. And that is directed by Lozy as well, same as this. It's very, very different. Not at all like this. But I highly recommend watching it because it just has really strong performances and things like that. So, yeah. He is interesting for another reason, which I think sometimes doesn't come up in discussions about film that much. He lived for four decades with a man called Anthony Forward, who was also an actor. So um, Bogard never came out publicly as gay, so I'm not going to say that he was gay or whatever. But um, it has, a lot of his friends have said that privately he was, and that if he had had what was sometimes called a lavender marriage, which was common in Hollywood at the time, he would have been bigger, and like as a star, I mean. Because a lavender marriage is where a gay woman and a gay man marry are married to each other publicly to kind of, I guess it's like, I think they just call it like a beard. Like it was like publicly hiding who you were. And that was because being gay was a criminal act at the time. And contracts had these morality clauses. So you could be, you could work in Hollywood and if it came out that you were not straight, you were doing something that was uh, legally criminal at the time, then you would lose your contract, you would lose all your work, your ability to work and all that kind of stuff. And obviously it's as a public figure, you know, like that would be incredibly, uh, you know, emotionally, socially destructive, you know, you can imagine. So, um, yeah, so people have said that if he had done that, had a lavender marriage, he would have been able to be more successful, but he was sort of not really openly gay, but he lived with somebody for four decades. And I just think, I hope that, I wanted to say I'm glad times have changed, but I feel like I hope times have changed because, you know, you hear all kinds of things. The world can be a little crazy and a little bit cruel sometimes, but I thought that was just a good moment to talk about that because I think sometimes it's not really talked about or sometimes there's this kind of giggly like, oh, you know, he was secretly gay, like this kind of salacious kind of thing. And I just think, you know, it's not a very human way to look at things. But that aside, uh, he has a great wig in this movie. He's got like a tan and then he has this white wig and it just creates this kind of look that I really like for him. Uh, the director was Joseph Losey, as I mentioned before. He studied with Brecht. <laughs> Every time I see Berthold Brecht's name come up, it just always reminds me of being... Um, <laughs> being <laughs> I studied um, drama and film at university. I have like 
that's what my degrees are in. <laughs> you always have to study these people like Brecht. And obviously like they're an important part of like movements within theater and stuff, but whenever it comes up, it just always reminds me of that. Anyway, uh, Joseph Losey was blacklisted during the fifties. And so he ended up leaving Hollywood and working in Europe, which I always, you know, you tend to hear this as being like, that's a loss to the film world and stuff like that. He was more connected to communism than um, some people who were blacklisted, who maybe had no connections or a very small connection. And yeah, he just kind of seems to have taken it in stride and just had a stiff upper lip about it, I guess. Um, he just said that he would have earned more in the US, but he probably would have died young from the intense like Hollywood lifestyle. So I don't know, I just thought that was like a positive um, take on the whole thing. We kind of come to the film itself. So this is very much a film that's style over substance, which I find kind of fun sometimes, especially because it's intentionally so. It's not like trying to be something it's not. It's trying to be what it is, and it does that well. Um, O'Donnell's character and the characters in his comic strips and books are more serious, maybe more gritty. So he really didn't like the tone of this film at all, and he clashed with Losey over it. The film is full of 60s style design. It's kind of pop art and it's very playful with form. Uh, as I said, it's like a send up of all the spy movies that were out there, but it's also just kind of its own thing. Um, this means like continuity errors, sometimes breaking the fourth wall, cutting all of the kind of tension and the real moments with humor. The plot is kind of incoherent. I mean, that's my opinion. I don't know, maybe it is coherent, but I found it to be like just nicely incoherent like you can kind of follow what's happening and everything but it's like it's not really about pinning it down to like you know yeah and there's frequent sort of changes in plot as well because of this kind of stylishness it was loved at can and was nominated for the palm d'or that year but it really didn't find its audience outside of that in the you know the general cinema but today it's considered a cult film. Movies like Austin Powers are really a response to films like this that were coming out in the 60s. It is just full of color and magic. There's literally a guy who is a henchman and he does magic tricks. And that was kind of fun. I like a little bit of that. But I mean, there's staircases painted glossy red against like purple check wallpaper that's kind of got like psychedelic waves through it. Um, there's a lot of color, there's spirals painted on the floor, there's like kind of Trump Lowell like elements in the buildings and the sets and stuff. So it's just suffused with this kind of lushness and strangeness. Uh, and it has some really interesting camera work as well. There's a lot of shots kind of reflections in mirrors and things like that. There's a lot of like one-liners that are just kind of casually thrown away, you know? Um, yeah, and I think one of my favorite scenes is just the opening scene where we meet Modesty. She lives in this, I mean, I don't know what the rest of her house is like, but when we meet her, her room is like in a tower and it's white, but with this plush pile wall-to-wall -wall carpet, it's circular. It's like a lighthouse or something and the outside spins. I mean, it looks very futuristic, like 60s futuristic. And then there's just these computers there that one of them gives her a readout on her fashion accessories or something. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's where she lives. It's great. I love it. Um, but yeah, the music is also a big part of it. It's kind of got a funky soundtrack. Maybe funky is more 70s, but uh, it's composed by Johnny Dankworth. And the theme song is by David and Jonathan, which um, if you were a fan of 60s music or around at the time, you might know them. Um, so yeah, I think one of the big things for me as somebody who likes co like costume design and clothing design and stuff like that was the costume changes. I absolutely love this. Uh, Monica Vitti looks great in the clothes that she has, but they're also just very... 60s clothes really played with design and proportion and shapes. And um, that's what you get a lot of in, in this 
film. There's a great little moment where she goes behind a plant and when she comes out, she has dark hair and a complete costume change. And that's when you see her dressed in the traditional sort of modesty blaze cat burglar outfit with the dark hair. And in that moment, Vidi looks a lot like the comic book character drawings, which I was like, that was pretty cool. But anyway, there's amazing clothes. There's this um, acid yellow um, coat, I guess, and it's kind of shaped like a triangle. And then the hood is like a cone shape with the face kind of at the front. It's something you would expect like maybe like Avedon or somebody to have photographed. And the cone shape, she like pulls a string and it opens out flat. Like it's bizarre and I love it. She also has these gold um, like cuffs that go with a particular outfit and they hide everything a woman needs. So they've got like a spot inside for like lipstick and spyware. And um, I thought that was really fun. So she has check print outfits with matching sunglasses. She plays with proportions and she names checks Dior and Balenciaga. Um, sadly, the costume designer isn't really credited properly here. There is somebody on uh, IMDb, but it seems like Terrence Stamp had a different costume designer. So I'm not really sure what that's about, but um, it's a shame because it's really fun this the style and the look of the whole thing and I mean it, it is every scene she's got a different outfit on which um, I find that really fun it's very playful after you get past the style and fashion there's a lot of humor here especially I mean modesty is very funny herself and Willie Garvin is kind of he's much more serious the Terrence Stamp brooding thing is kind of in effect but some of the side characters are really great. So I'm going to name check Mrs. Fothergill. She is amazing. Mrs. Fothergill is Dirk Bogart's character's uh, bodyguard. She's just always kind of bored, always wearing this orange, like 60s orange bikini with matching little wrap. Very stylish and she just kind of casually kills people but the way she does it she'll kind of wave at gabriel like oh hey honey kind of thing and be like murdering someone and um i don't know it's just done in a very funny way uh there is the death of they have a a spy gabriel has a spy who is a mime but he's never not a mime so when she's killing him he's like miming dying like it's very sort of stylized it's very funny um, there's also lots of like little things like there's this weird glassware and so Gabriel and McWhirter are having like a cocktail on the terrace while they discuss, you know, bad guy stuff and <laughs> Gabriel's glass is huge with this long stem and then McWhirter's is tiny with this long stem and then there's a point where McWhirter looks over and there's just a goldfish swimming around. <laughs> And the other guys drink it's like it's very funny um yeah and of, of course the secret service guys are very much straight men constantly sort of stuffy and making comments to modesty blazes joyful kind of insouciance like very juxtaposed characters or she's all color and they're all like suits and stuff um there's also a bad guy who does magic tricks i think i might have mentioned him before he's a great addition to the whole thing so yeah um, that's kind of the movie. There is, uh, O'Donnell made a novelization of the screenplay because he wrote the story for this. So he made a novelization of it and that novel was more popular than the movie. And it was so popular that he ended up continuing the series. So if you're looking up Modesty Blaze, if you, maybe if you don't know her or whatever. So there was a comic series and a novel series. And I don't know, I think that's really cool. He really, I don't think he really liked this film at all. Um, but the covers of the books are really, really great. I love kind of pulp paperback covers, especially mystery and spy ones. They're really, really fun. Um, I feel like at the time that they were made, they were meant to be quite serious. And when you look at them now, they feel kind of quaint and old fashioned. And I really like the style of them. But um, there's kind of, a difference 
to me that's interesting between the movie and the book series. So Willie Garvin is a character who was a criminal. I think he was in prison or something. And Modesty Blaze gets him out of prison and he's eternally grateful to her for giving him a second chance and he becomes her sort of sidekick. And when she calls on him to help her out with stuff, he'll kind of drop everything. But he's, in the book, he's never a love interest of hers. They have this platonic, you know, loyal friendship. And I think that's really nice. I think so often if you have a you know, male-female thing, it will sort of try and force this, like, will they, won't they thing, and it just is a bit boring, sometimes there's not, I don't know, I mean, people can be friends, not every single friendship is a, re is a romantic relationship, you know, I think it's kind of overdone, and so it's really nice to see this other kind of relationship, this friendship. Um, in the movie, there are a couple of sort of funny scenes where it doesn't seem like they seriously mean it, but they kind of hint that there's a little bit of will they, won't they. But it's sort of not. Like, I can't quite tell. There's a scene at the end of the film where they're, like, singing to each other about, like, they're going to get married. But it actually seems like they're being sarcastic. But I don't know. It seems like a change between the book and the movie. Uh, yeah. Speaking of which, there are... There's not a lot of Modesty Blaze movie and TV things. There was an 82 movie and a 2004 movie, but they just kind of look from the... I mean, I haven't watched them. They don't look like they're big budget or, um, you know, we're kind of aiming for the, the big bucks kind of thing. Um, there was a, I think, a pilot for a TV show. But I feel like she's such a great character and she feels very, very modern to me with um, the way she is and all that kind of stuff. So I think it'd be interesting to see if there is ever a, uh, like a franchise or something. The thing is, I'm kind of very tired of franchise movies lately. I don't know how you guys feel, but it just feels like everything is a franchise. And you just sort of get these like filler movies that are just between like one episode movie and another episode movie, if that makes sense. And they get a bit boring. So hopefully it won't kind of end up like that or you know, some of her more interesting points and tones getting lost, but it would be cool to see another movie of her that was maybe a bit more true to the comic book style. Um, has my cat, can you hear him? He's ridiculous. I don't even know what he wants today. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, check out this fun little cult classic film, uh, or maybe find some Modesty Blaze to read. I'm gonna check out some of the books I think, uh, or the comics. I think she sounds like a lot of fun to kind of explore that a little bit. Um, I also want to tell you guys, I wrote a piece for an anthology book called Death Never Dies. I'm going to put a link in the bio just in case you want to check it out. Um, my piece is about Olivia de Havilland and uh, kind of a little bit about the impact movies have had on my life. So it's a great book about people that died in 2020 and how we mourn the loss of celebrities and things in our lives it's very i know it's said it's about death but it's very positive and very celebrate cele <laughs> celebrative is that a word of life and so i just thought i'd mention it to you guys because it's um probably something that some of you would like it has great illustrations by lee fernside as well so you can just go take a look at those if you want um uh, just put the link below and um yeah that's modesty blaze so thanks for watching <laughs>